Right now, the state of neuroscience and needs are such that we are using various different approaches to attack different problems. And so I would like to talk about this with the focus in the context of neurological disease and treatment. Oh, and before we go on to that, also I wanted to briefly mention an example of how we might advance uh, the brain uh, area through industrial collaboration. And this is an example for a, a, a neuroprobe that was developed through collaboration with industry because this is a semiconductor process that was used to make these very high channel count electrodes. And in this case, there was a lot of challenge in making that happen from the academic sides where there was a very few uh, probes needed early on during development and with the current way the semiconductor industry is uh, organized, it's very, it, it was very difficult to get anybody to make it, for example. Uh, but going forward, taking it from the very basic science level to translation, there would be a lot of uh, different forms of industrial collaboration needed. And as I mentioned, uh, there are um, dire needs for the brain, and we know that there is no cure for any of this. And I would like to emphasize why that might be the case. And for many, uh, we, it is a very well accepted fact that the brain is actually a circuit where it has a different integrated circuit function that's controlling all of our behavior. And so fundamentally, if you want to restore something that has gone wrong in terms of how the brain controls behavior, you need to be able to fix the circuit. But currently, none of the therapies that are being developed to address this question is considering concretely what exactly is the circuit that is controlling uh, our brain? Ideally, if we had a very good understanding of what the brain circuit does, we can just fix it like the way we fix electronic circuits. Um, however, the key problem is that we have very limited capability to do that. If you currently go to the clinic because you have a suspected problem with neurological condition, what do you think they do for you? They basically sit you down and they talk to you. They talk to see what's, what might be going on in your brain. And imagine looking at your phone and just talking to your phone to figure out what's wrong with the circuit inside. It's, it's impossible to figure out what such a complex system is doing uh, wrong by just talking to them. You really need a direct understanding of what the circuit is doing but that is currently not available. And among all the different neurological disease where you don't measure anything in the brain, there is one case um, in the case of epilepsy where they, measure, they directly measure brain signal using an EEG uh, cap, which is pretty much the most advanced form of looking at brain function nowadays in the clinic. And it's also manually read by the doctor just looking at uh, these signals to figure out what's going on. And that's, of course, not a very um, useful situation, which is partly responsible for why we don't know what's wrong with most of our brain disease. And when you don't know what's wrong with it, it's very hard to fix it, obviously. And on the other hand, we do use, as uh, Adam and Hongun mentioned, we do use direct brain stimulation approaches where you're inserting electrodes into the brain uh, to, in hopes of fixing some of the things that has gone wrong with the brain circuit. And this is an example of a deep brain stimulator that has uh, electrode uh, inside specific region of the brain to reverse the disease related outcome. However, the key problem is that these are done empirically. It's not done because you know exactly where to put it and what's done. This was the normal state. This is what's wrong with it, so I'm going to fix it. It's not done in a systematic way that engineers might imagine. This is done in a way where, you know what? We tried it, and it kind of works. And so we're going to run a large clinical trial, see if it works. And then, oh, it seems to work most of the time, so we'll do it. The problem with that is doing the same procedure, it might result in opposite outcome where the patient becomes worse, or it may not really have a good outcome, or in another case, it may work initially, but then it doesn't. Also, there are some cases where we find this to be useful, but there are many other cases where uh, we might be able to do much better, but we can't because we don't really know what the brain's control algorithm is. 
And this is an example of a study that was done in my lab where you can see that even if you put electrical control of the brain into the same part of the brain, depending on what encoding you do, here we're changing the frequency of stimulation, it's engaging the brain in a completely different way where here you can see that uh, the brain has a uh, very limited uh, decreased signal in a sensory area, and here there's very massive engagements of very large parts of the brain. And in this case, the only thing that was done was put the electrode in the same place, but uh, run different frequency signal. So you can imagine not knowing what the brain does and blindly putting things in and slightly changing frequency, getting an opposite outcome uh, in a scenario where you don't know what you're doing. And so it's critical that you understand how uh, these things interact with the brain. So neuroscientists, if you talk to them, they would tell you, my God, the brain is so complex. We don't know anything, and we have to do so much more work to get somewhere. That's absolutely true. At the same time, there are different approaches as an engineer to think about how we might tackle this problem. And one of the key approaches that we can think about is to start to construct algorithms of how specific behavioral units are executed within the brain. So here, this is an example of a mouse that's being controlled. A very specific cell type within the brain is controlled. And then you can see the mouse is turning in one direction. And on the right is an example of how we constructed a functional diagram of how that behavior is controlled within the brain. And so I'd like to end by saying that right now, the state of neuroscience and needs are such that we are using various different approaches to attack different problems. We saw the uh, virtual reality version. We saw different brain plugs. We saw different imaging approaches they have different utility and application. And it's just like when we had, for example, a typewriter, a phone, and a gigantic computer, where now we're starting to make these different units of advance. But perhaps later, we might have a smartphone version where we can readily upload and download all the different uh, information into the brain, but we are quite far from that. But at the same time, making significant progress in every front where we're now starting to see differences in uh, changing our clinical practice as well as uh, changing our experience in how we interact with the world.